Welcome to The Real News Network and welcome to Reality Asserts Itself. Sparrows Point is an industrial location just outside of Baltimore City. In the late 1950s, Bethlehem Steel had 30,000 people working there. By 2012, there was nobody. To help tell us the story of why and how that happened and could public policy have made a difference, joining us in the studio is Mark Reuter. Mark has been reporting and writing on Baltimore since 1970 when he started as a 19-year-old summer intern covering cops for the Evening Sun. He later moved on to the Baltimore Sun where he was a reporter for eight years. In addition to his writings on Baltimore, he's edited the historical magazine Railroad History and he's the author of Making Steel, Sparrows Point and the Rise and Ruin of American Industrial Might. And he's the senior writer at the Baltimore Brew, which is doing the best investigative journalism in the city of Baltimore. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. So your book is about like this thick. Um, so you can't give us all the detail, but give us the first to start the conversation, just the big brush strokes of why steel collapsed, closed in Baltimore County. The broad brush stroke is that, um, you know, steel was the, the biggest basic industry in the first part of the 20th century. Um, it was the um, foundation of, of really modern society. But things began to change after that. Technology moved on. There were um, other um, materials, aluminum, plastic, and others that began to be developed. And these began to impinge on this, this huge uh, industry that had a basic monopoly for many, many years. Faced with that um, competition and, of, and change, uh, the steel industry, both at Sparrows Point and around the country at these big installations, Chicago, Pittsburgh, etc., stayed put and they they just put their feet down they decided that um, no one was going to dislodge them that it was foreign competition and over government government over regulation that was the cause and they weren't about to change finally they just cannibalized themselves and eventually the mill was just a mishmash at its very tail end it was a mishmash of old and new and basically leaking money throughout the whole process. Now, steel production moved to a large extent to Asia and some other places. There's lots of steel being produced. There's lots of steel being used. Mm -hmm. um, why couldn't it be here? Um, I mean, one of the arguments one hears is that it's, it's essentially was the cost of labor. Mm -hmm. And so China's cheaper labor. So China's kind of because nobody would defend the American steel market. It's really China is the, is the reason for the demise of American steel. Well, going out of uh, World War II, the U.S. had around 60% of the world's steel production. And a part of that was, yes, Europe had destroyed itself during the war. Uh, one little known fact is that the U.S. steel industry then doubled its, its actual production between 1945 and 1960. But it doubled it in old technology while things were, were massively changing and their costs did get too high. You and probably the, some of the listeners will remember if you go back, not just with um, President Kennedy, but how once a year U.S. Steel would announce a price increase of five or six percent for hot coiled steel and within hours, every single of the other so-called big steel companies, Bethlehem, Inland, Armco, Jones and Laughlin, all kind of lost names, all did the same lockstep. And um, so, you know, a lot of it had to do is that the U.S. steel companies priced themselves out of the business and they didn't innovate. Well, how much, so there's two different pieces here. Mm -hmm. There's the cost of labor and there's innovation and technology. So right. let's start with what is usually talked about, which is that labor costs were too high and the American worker just cost way more than the Chinese worker. And that's the reason steel left. I hear that all the time. Well, eventually that became the case, but let's go back. Um, back in the 1950s, there was also the very strong um, steel workers union, which came out of John L. Lewis and the coal miners. And they became known in the 50s under their president, McDonald, as the business union. They were always compared to Walter Ruther and others, uh, coal workers, 
gee, those guys go on strikes, they have progressive ideas, but the steel workers are a business union that's all meat and potatoes, dollars and cents. At the same time, the steel industry would raise its prices year after year in lockstep. They would give raises to the steel workers union, and the two of them really worked in, in collusion because both of them believed that steel was essential and that it would never go away. The first challenge to the supremacy of Sparrows Point came in the 1960s, and it came not from, well, China didn't have a steel industry then. It didn't even come from Japan or Europe. It came from a company in Richmond, Virginia, called Reynolds Aluminum. Reynolds developed a new type of orange juice can using aluminum, an extruded aluminum, that while much weaker than steel, had certain properties that bottl bottlers or canners, national can, continental can, had been asking steel to do for years, and they said, tough, we're gonna do it the way we've always done it. Sparrows Point lost the orange juice bottling or canning market. They then lost the soft drink, Coke, Pepsi canning market. They then lost the beer canning market, which was the very market that was of extreme importance to Sparrows Point in getting it through the Depression in the 1930s, where they had done some innovation and gotten um, uh, a large quantities of cans to be produced after the end of um, Prohibition. So there really was a huge technological side. And going back to labor, here's a really gr great story. Um, Sparrows Point had 3,000 men, all men, who worked in the open hearth furnaces. They were the largest open hearths in size in the world. They were gigantic. They were also, they could produce 400 tons of steel a heat, but it would take them eight hours to do this. The basic oxygen furnace that could produce much less but much faster was coming in in Europe. But Sparrows Point opted in the late 50s to produce, to buy even more and install even more of, the, of these open hearths. So they had 4,000 workers, heavy, dangerous work. But here's the most interesting thing. The man who was the, the superintendent of that, I was told by, by many people, um, was the most opposed to any sort of job or cutbacks or changes because by having 4,000 men in his unit, he was able to sit at the first table at the private country club facing the general manager, and he wanted to keep his seat at the table. The, there seems to be two theories of what happened uh, in the broadest way to Sparrow's point. One is American workers price themselves out of the market. The other is on the level on the on the side of innovation, but essentially investing in new technology. Mm -hmm. That really is what made steel uncompetitive, especially with rising Japan and China. That they sure. just leapfrog to right. much more efficient technology, mm -hmm. and that it could have been done here. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the other big problem was not just that they were able to leapfrog a new technology. That's true, although surprisingly China to this date uses open hearth furnaces. It has an awful lot of very old technology. Um, and in when the, a very cyclical industry steel, when steel was booming, even 10 years before the demise of Sparrows Point, this very old equipment could make money, and that's what sort of was the rationale which it uh, stayed on. What was going on with management and with unions and with this, this kind of inherited power they s saw, and that they worked in a world that was really surrounded by massive machinery, it was on its own peninsula, it was smoky and clouded all day long, they worked 24-hour shifts where they oftentimes didn't see their families. There was a, a mentality. This is what I picked up and write about in my book and was the most striking thing from the literally hundreds of interviews I had over the 10 years I worked on this book um, because I got so fascinated with the culture. What fascinated me was the technology was all there. The money was there. Bethlehem had tons of money. What was lacking was the willpower, the ability 
of these strong men who prided themselves on their strength to see the future. I mean, just they've been monopolies for so long, they just felt there was never going to be a challenge. When um, the final incarnation of Sparrows Point, this, this kind of ramshackle company called R.G. Steele, declared bankruptcy in 2012, thus ending in a very ignoble note, the end of Steele making 120 years at this peninsula, Around a, um, a month after that happened, the steel workers held a meeting where a disastrous thing happened. Much to their surprise, no big steel company or small steel company stepped in in bankruptcy court in Delaware and said, I want Sparrows Point. Instead, two liquidators came in and grabbed the plant at a bargain basement price. There was a union meeting where the union went to tell the workers that, um, that everything was over. Everything was gone. Uh, they were, again, the union was so um, uh, uninvolved and outside of its own politics that you know, no press or anyone could go into this. Well, there was no problem there. I slipped right in in my heart, in my cap and everything. And so I listened to it all. And men were getting up uh, and saying, well, why didn't I get my vacation pay last week? They were still arguing over this and that, and it was over. What the union wasn't explicitly telling them, what the Baltimore Brew was then writing was, you not only lost that, but the new company signed an agreement um, that all labor, previous labor agreements were over and done with. They, they were gone. They weren't going to get a pension, they weren't going to get anything. They weren't, and vacation pay was the least of their problems. And, well, thanks very much for joining us. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.